Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The purpose of today's segment is to take the first crucial steps toward mastery of the topic of carbohydrates. And let's put those in the larger context in which we've been operating here. So remember that the biochemical core of organisms is their biochemically encoded design information, which is replicated competitively, producing natural selection over generation after generation. And that design information, in order to replicate successfully in that competitive environment produces tools, and the direct tools they produce are almost exclusively protein molecules, which fold up to form macromolecular machines of various sorts, including catalysts that catalyze all kinds of different reactions. But one of the key subsets of the biochemical reactions catalyzed by these macromolecular machines, these catalysts, is the building of other macromolecules. And in fact, carbohydrates are one of several classes of those other macromolecules, lipids being the other major one, which we'll talk about uh, elsewhere. And our goal today is just to understand the basics of carbohydrates, how they're made, what the nomenclature for describing them is, some of their elementary and but crucial chemical properties, uh, and then look at a couple of their biological uh, actions, that is, when they show up in organisms and what the implications of their presence are. So let's start with the basics, monosaccharides, single monomer units. So the mono should key that to you here. These are polymers, like proteins are polymers, like nucleic acids are polymers, but these polymers are not genetically encoded directly. They're built by genetically encoded tools, uh, catalysts that build them from scratch. So uh, they're especially well named. So most of the basic carbohydrates, uh, ones that we'll talk about in, uh, shortly in uh, uh, segments to follow on metabolism, like glucose, for example, uh, are uh, very well named by the name carbohydrate. That is their uh, empirical uh, chemical formula is one water per carbon. That is one H2O, one carbon atom times N. And a particularly typical uh, monosaccharide glucose, as you'll see, it's all over the place in metabolism and biological structure. It's probably the most common um, monomer, biological monomer in the biosphere for reasons that will emerge. And it, in fact, has CH2O times 6 as its empirical formula, its uh, stoichiometric, chemical stoichiometry. So let's begin by the first crucial element of nomenclature, that is uh, monosaccharides, single sugar units, are either ketoses or aldoses. Let's illustrate what that means. So glucose is in fact an aldose. What does that mean? It means that the carbonyl group, characteristic of monosaccharides, so all conventional monosaccharides have a carbonyl group, one of their properties, and uh, aldoses have an aldehyde carbonyl group. Ketoses have a ketone carbohydrate group. Uh, I'm sorry, carbonyl group. Notice that I've boxed the respective groups here. Glucose is an aldose. It has an aldehyde group. Fructose is a ketose, and it has a ketone group. Okay? So uh, sugars are often named as uh, ketoses or aldoses, as you'll see over the next few minutes. Let's also look then at the numbering scheme. So the numbering scheme is to number the carbon uh, at the uh, um, end of the linear projection of the uh, structure of the monosaccharide, the carbon either containing or nearest to the carbonyl group as the one carbon and then number down from there. So notice the one through six numbering of glucose and the one through six numbering of fructose. So the one carbon is either the carbonyl bearing carbon or the one, the terminal carbon closest to it as in the fructose case, for example. Okay, another uh, element of nomenclature, you'll know th notice the letter D here. As we talked about extensively in the context of amino acids, uh, biological molecules virtually without exception are uh, stereoisomer specific. They're stereo specific. Uh, they're not racemic mixtures of the two stereoisomers. In the case of amino acids, it turns out coincidentally that it is the L configuration that is uh, broadly represented. In uh, monosaccharides, the opposite is true. It is the D configuration. L uh, configurations of monosaccharides are quite uncommon, occurring only in specialized circumstances. So when we talk about, uh, later in metabolism, we talk about blood sugar, we talk about glucose, we'll often just implicitly say glucose, uh, knowing that everyone recognizes that we're talking about D glucose unless otherwise specified. Let's talk about where that nomenclature comes from. So D sugars have, as both D fructose and D uh, glucose here illustrate, have the hydroxyl group on the asymmetric carbon, that is the stereosymmetric uh, carbon, um, um, stereospecific carbon rather, furthest from the carbonyl group. So in this case, it's the five carbon in both glucose 
and fructose. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the Fisher projection, the hydroxyl is to the right. So L uh, 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 sugars would have the, this five carbon linked hydroxyl group projecting to the left in the Fisher projection. That's its stereochemistry. So let's put this in the larger context of all um, uh, aldoses first. This really complicated diagram is a little intimidating at first. It's actually not as bad as it seems. Let's take a minute and zero in on it and talk through several of the things that we need to pay attention to. So first notice that these sugars, just like L amino acids, are named relative to the glyceraldehyde stereoisomers that were the original Fisher's original uh, go-to reference compound. So the, these compounds are named not for any uh, particular physiological or biosynthetic reason, but just for the organic chemist's uh, convenience to be able to um, organize them uh, mentally uh, with respect to structure. So notice that in the D stereoisomer, the Fisher projection thereof of uh, glyceraldehyde, the hydroxyl group projects to the right, as we've talked about. And that's true of all of these D uh, monosaccharides, uh, as you can see, all circled in green here. Let's now look at the this organization. Again, this organization does not imply anything about synthesis or biological function. It's just a human invention to keep track of all of these potential structures. I say potential because most of these structures actually don't occur very often in biological systems, and we won't be paying a lot of attention to most of them. I'll come back and point out to you the few that are important in a moment. But this gives us a chance to introduce a new term, uh, epimers, or, uh, and the change of epimers called ep epimerization or epimerization. Notice that the two uh, erythros and threos here differ around the two carbon. They are two C2 epimers. So they are otherwise identical, except the stereochemistry around C2 is different. And uh, uh, D erythros has uh, uh, the hydroxyl group projecting to the right in the Fisher projection, threos to the left. And again, their stereochem the same is true now as we go down to the aldopentoses. We were looking at the aldotrios, the aldo tetros, and now we're at the aldopentose, uh, meaning five sugar, uh, five carbon aldoses. And again, notice that each pair is a C2 epimer. Notice that here, boxed in red. And then they are, uh, the two pairs are joined by their shared common stereoisomerization around what is now their C3, okay? What was the C2 of the aldotrioses above, I'm sorry, aldo, I keep saying that, aldotetroses above. Okay, uh, and ditto over here, the same nomenclature. So in other words, these are laid out in an intellectually simple, systematic way. So most biochemical courses you take will not require you to memorize most of these structures. I'll call your attention in a moment to the few that you will want to memorize. But even if you were, in fact, tasked with memorizing these structures, if you keep in mind their structural relationships to one another, uh, the memorization of uh, these, uh, all these uh, aldoses is, in fact, a quite achievable task if you, in fact, needed to do that. Again, we see the same thing now on the next uh, uh, level of organization, the aldohexoses. These are, in fact, again, C2 epimers organized in this way. So here, uh, organized around a common uh, stereochemistry, now around their C3, what was the C2 of the aldopentose uh, sugars above. Uh, and the same is true all across the, I won't uh, highlight it here for you, uh, but you might want to print the sheet out and walk through and see that the other pairs of epimers across the aldohexoses behave in exactly the same way as this pair. Let's now deal with the issue of which one of these ones of these actually play large biological roles. And there are, in fact, only uh, five of them, and they are boxed here. So glyceraldehyde, typically in a phosphorylated form at the top, plays a role in metabolism, as does glucose at the bottom. In fact, when you talk about blood sugar in metabolism, as we will in the following segments, it is this sugar, D-glucose, that you're talking about. Um, Ribose is important. We'll come to this uh, in more detail in a couple of minutes. It is a major subcomponent of nucleic acids. So ribose can be... Or <laughs>